Thank you so much, everybody. I am so glad to be here. You probably want me to take this mask off, right? Do you want to put more masks on? I'm at the tail end of a little cold that is absolutely not COVID, but if you just want to be safe, feel free. Thank you, William. It's always a little risky. I didn't know what William was going to say, but thank you for not uh, throwing any, for not roasting me there, yes. Well, today I'm going to talk to you about the progress of the Holy Grail through literature from the Gospels to the Vault of the Adepti. And don't worry if you don't know what that is, we will get there. But I want to start out with a little participation from you, and there'll be some chances throughout for you to share some ideas and ask some questions as well. So would you just start out with brainstorming what words or phrases come to mind when you hear the Holy Grail? Monty Python. What else? Galahad, in Indiana Jones, Percival, Parsifal, very good. What else? Woo, that's a deep dive. Nice. Anything else? Prester, another deep dive with Prester John. Okay. Really? Ready Player One. All right, we'll have to talk later about how. Very good. <laughs> awesome. So as I prepared for this talk and looked over kind of the history of the legends of the Holy Grail, I realized that one thing the Grail is all about is embodied fellowship, communion in and with the flesh. I thought about the round table and then the table on which the Lord's Supper is served, and I realized that that's what they have in common, fellowship, eating together, sitting down together. A time and a place where time slows down when the personal body and the social body meet. And this probably was brought to my attention, much like the way that Sarah began her talk, because the pandemic forced many of us to isolate and be starved for in-person community. And I was, as I'm sure many of you, effectively barred from the sacrament for over a year. Wait, am I allowed to call it a sacrament among Presbyterians? Um, so I thought that I would, it would be fun to bring that to life and have us eat together. So I was like, I know, I'll make cookies in the shape of the Holy Grail. And so I wrote to Ron and said, how many people are coming? And he said, 250. And I was like, whoa, I don't have time to bake 250 cookies. So what I did is I just made one dozen, and we're going to have a quiz, and there'll be the prizes for the quiz, OK? So we have a quiz about the Holy Grail. Do you have paper and something you can write down your answers? There are 10 questions, and I'll give you all 10 and then we'll go over the answers and you can, you can score your quiz, okay? Okay. Paper and writing utensils. Or, I mean, if you have a perfect memory, if it's C.S. Lewisian, Lewisian memory, memorize your answers to all 10. Question one, so just write it down, don't say it out loud, please. Is the grail A, a cup, B, a platter, C, a stone? Okay, is the grail a cup, a platter, or a stone? Number two, does the Holy Grail have scriptural precedent? Does it come from the Bible somehow? If you say yes, maybe you want to say where or how. If you say no, that's cool. All right, here's a tough one. And they're quite varied. There's probably enough different variety of these questions that at least one of them will annoy you. I mean, please you. Which literary author invented the concept of the Grail as we know it today? Which literary author invented the concept of the Grail? Number four, in what literary work does the exact phrase, the Holy Grail, well, in French, occur for the first time? Okay. So it's a different answer for number three. Four, in what literary work does the exact phrase, the Holy Grail, or Le Saint Graal, occur for the first time? Number five, in Sir Thomas Mallory's Le Mort d'Arthur, which three knights achieved the Grail? So who are the three knights who achieved the grail in Mallory? Number six, in Monty Python and the Holy Grail, who achieves the quest? Good with that one. Number seven, in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, what power does the grail have? Just a few more. This next one, there's a few possible answers to. Number eight, what is the connection between the King Arthur legends and Tolkien's 
mythology or legendarium. Connections between Tolkien and the King Arthur myths. So there's a few possible answers to that one. No, not multiple choice. <laughs> Number nine, what is the title of Charles Williams's Grail novel? The title of Charles Williams's Grail novel. And the last one, number 10. Where is the ring of Arthur the King? What lord has such a treasure in his house? No, oh, nobody got the joke, okay. That was the question, number 10. Where is the ring of Arthur the king? What lord has such a treasure in his house? That's one of the questions that Merlin asks of Ransom in that hideous strength. So that's why it was sort of a joke, because if you knew the answer, you'd be the next pen dragon. Okay, did you hear any of them repeated before we go over the answers? Number six. Number six was, in Monty Python and the Holy Grail, who achieves the quest? Anybody else need to hear another one repeated? Number eight, what is the connection between King Arthur legends and Tolkien's mythology? Between Tolkien and King Arthur. Okay, you want the answers? And some of them will be up for a little bit of discussion. Okay, number one, is the grail a cup, a platter, or a stone? Quick trick question, all of the above. So started off unfairly, well done, Joe. Uh, number two, does the Holy Grail have biblical precedent? How many said no? How many said yes? The yeses are correct, and we will get into where it has its precedent. Just a little bit. Number three, which literary author invented the concept of the Grail? Not anonymous. I'll give you Chrétien de Troyes. There is a recent discovery that maybe he wasn't the first, but you can have Chrétien de Troyes. It may have been Baudry de Bourgay. We'll, we'll get to it. In what literary work does the exact phrase the Holy Grail occur for the first time? Say again? Nope, but good. I'm a little earlier than that. Nope. Good, though. You're much closer, historically. The first continuation of Chrétien, because Chrétien died without finishing the story, so we don't know what would happen, and so the first continuer, so Anonymous would have been correct on that one, because we don't know who the first continuer was. Okay, who are the three who achieved the grail in Mallory? Uh, the work is first continuation. Yeah, the title of the work. So the scholars title it, it doesn't have a title in the manuscript. Uh, which of the three knights who achieved the grail in Mallory? Yes, Percival, Galahad, and Bors. Ding, ding. Uh, who achieves it in Monty Python and the Holy Grail? Hmm? I mean, nobody, but you can have it. Yeah. It just ends in disaster and failure, right? Uh, what is the power that the Grail has in Indiana and the Last Crusade? Yeah, healing, eternal life, but like immortal life on this earth. So, a little unclear. Healing, eternal life. What did you say about the connections between Tolkien and King Arthur? Because that's, that's super interesting and multiple answers. Um, but the connections between King Arthur and his own legendarium, his own mythology. Yeah, so the main, the main connection is his book, The Fall of Arthur, but do you know how it overlaps with his elvish mythology? Anybody? Yes. The Return of a Rightful King. That is awesome. Yes, really, really good. Yes, that's right, Numenor and its connection to Atlantis and also Avalon, the island where King Arthur goes at the end. Brilliant. Um, and there's one other connection. At the end of the fall of Arthur, Lancelot is going to sail into the west to seek Arthur and never return, just like the elf Erendil in Tolkien's own mythology. And Tolkien actually made that connection in, in a note, in a draft. Okay, what is the title of Charles Williams' Grail novel? War in Heaven. War in Heaven, very good. Um, and where is the ring of Arthur the king? What lord has such a treasure in his house? Did anybody get any part of that? Yes, Paralandra, very good. So the ransom answers, the ring of the king is on Arthur's finger where he sits in the house of kings in the cup-shaped land of Abhaljan beyond the seas of Lur in Paralandra. For Arthur did not die, 
but our Lord took him to be in the body till the end of time and the shattering of Solva with Enoch and Elias and Moses and Melchizedek the king. Melchizedek is he in whose hall the steep stoned ring sparkles on the forefinger of the pen dragon. So this is kind of a spoiler to where I'm going in the end, but what the Inklings loved to do is to take their own invented legends and myths and weave them together with classic British literature, or do, the, or do the other way around, take these classic texts and bring them into their own mythologies and invented worlds. Okay, so who got 10 points? Nine? Joe, what'd you get? Can you, can you count? Can you count it up? Who got eight? <gasps> David got eight! Yay! Seven? Oh, wow, this was a tough quiz. No wonder my students complain about me being a tough teacher. This is awful. Six points. Congratulations. Five. Four. Yay, three. Woo, so it sounds like anybody who got three or above gets a cookie. Can I get somebody to pass them out? <laughs> Can I get a volunteer to uh, go around and hand these out? Oh, thank you, Sarah. So anybody who got three or more, put up your hand and Sarah will give you a grail-shaped cookie. So you have won the Holy Grail. So as we just touched on, the Grail does have biblical precedent. It is traditionally associated with Christ's passion. It was either the cup from which Jesus and the apostles drank at the Last Supper, and which Joseph of Arimathea, uh, you should get a cookie anyway, Joseph of Arimathea lady, whether you got enough points or not, because that was awesome. Um, <laughs> and which Joseph of Arimathea used to catch blood from Jesus' side at the cross, according to one legend, or it was the platter or the plate on which he ate bread for the last time before his crucifixion. Then there's also a German text, um, Wolfram von Eschenbach, in which it is a stone as well. So what I want to do for the rest of the time here is take a look at selected European grail texts and their cultural context about how was the Bible being understood and approached in their time and place, and how did that influence the way they wrote about the Holy Grail? Okay, so it's bringing a couple of things together. How was the Bible thought of and understood and read at the time, and then how did that influence the way these authors wrote about the Holy Grail? And what I've observed is that the brief biblical texts where the idea originated serve as the tiny little story seed from which subsequent artists grew great forests of legend. So they start with something really small and we end up with this vast body of literature from just that single little reference. Writers are not really responding to the Bible per se in this story, but to how previous writers have trained and cultivated that seed as well as using the Arthurian story to explore ways that their culture is responding to the Bible in their times. So we'll quick, quickly glance at the biblical precedent, the accounts of the Last Supper in the Gospels and the Epistles. So what is the vessel that we're talking about in the Bible? Here's from Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 to 28, um, account of the Last Supper. Now while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is being poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, clearly, the cup itself, the physical object, is not a big item of focus in the texts, right? But over time, it took on more legendary significance. There are parallel passages in Matthew and in Luke. About these passages from the Gospels, Charles Williams wrote, this is the first mention of that cup, which in its progress through the imagination of Europe was to absorb into itself so many cauldrons of plenty and vessels of magic. So we're gonna trace that prog progress through the imagination of Europe. But I also wanna mention the passage in 1 Corinthians, right? That is often used in Lord's Supper ceremonies <clears throat> in churches to this day. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we read, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me, thank you. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So clearly, Soon after 
the writing of the epistles in the first century, the cup from which Jesus drank at the Last Supper was a metonym for his sacrifice, right? Like a, a small object that's related to this larger event and so carries this spiritual significance. There's also a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, is the cup of blessing which we bless not a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is the bread which we break not a sharing in the body of Christ? <clears throat> So there's also other uses of the cup metaphorically in the Bible, such as when Jesus asks the disciples if they will drink from the cup that he will drink from, and when he prays to the Father that the cup might pass from him. In those references, it's connected to death and crucifixion and martyrdom, right? There are also mentions in the Bible of the cup of God's wrath. So the cup becomes this multiplicitous symbol that carries varying significance. As the scholar Joanna Bellis notes, there are two strands to the biblical imagery of cups. The dominant theme, she says, in which they are the casks of divine fury and a rarer rapturous counter melody in which they represent the kindness and salvation of the Almighty. It took a thousand years for those two strands really to come together into the Holy Grail that we think of today because the great Grail romances do not emerge until the 12th and 13th centuries. Interestingly, after a couple of centuries of conflict over Bible translation. The first partial translations of the Old Testament into Old English, which were maybe by or overseen or edited by Alfred of Einsham, were made maybe in the early part of the 11th century. And when he was asked, Alfred was very hesitant to make this translation, reflecting the church's ambiguity about the wide availability of editions of the Bible in the vernacular because they were afraid of misinterpretation of scripture or a departure into heresy. So bear in mind that stories about the grail and its significance were evolving along with beliefs about the accessibility and interpretation of the Bible. And that kind of makes sense. If you're taking this cup, this goblet, as a symbol of both God's wrath and punishment, but also salvation, you're gonna have that involved in debates about its accessibility to the masses, about its relationship to confessions of belief and so forth, just as you're talking about who has the right to handle the scriptures and interpret the Bible. Now, some scholars trace legends of the grail to the various vessels in early Welsh Arthurian literature. This is what Charles Williams was referring to when he said it has absorbed into itself cauldrons of plenty because in early Welsh mythology, there are such things as um, Caradwyn's magical cauldron in the Mabinogion, which held a potion that granted knowledge and inspiration. In the Celtic legend of Bran the Blessed, the cauldron appears as a vessel of wisdom and rebirth, and it has this very handy feature uh, for military leaders, which is that if you throw the corpses of dead warriors into it, they will be resurrected. They can't speak or think, but they can fight pretty well, so. That's handy. In the mythological cycle of early Irish literature, the mythological people, the Tuatha Dé Danann, brought with them four magical items to Ireland from their mythical islands in the West. There's a Tolkienian phrase for you. One of the treasures they brought was the cauldron of the Gagda, from which no company ever went away unsatisfied. So it's a cauldron of plenty, right? Like a cornucopia, it can continue to feed uh, the hosts. A couple of 14th century Welsh poems in the book of Taliesin tell of an adventure by Arthur and his men to obtain a cauldron with magical properties. Several scholars even to this day point to a Welsh original for the legend of the grail as a cauldron of plenty or a vessel of fertility, which maybe you can see is a little bit in tension or conflict with the idea of a biblical first century origin for this cup, right? Now I bring that up the idea of the Welsh origins, mainly because at the time of the Inklings, several scholars put forward very persuasive and influential theories about the supposed folkloric origins of the Grail. This was the time of the appearance of comparative religion as a field of academic study, and of the interest generated by T.S. Eliot's best-selling poem, The Wasteland, in 1922. So their hypotheses from such writers as Sir James Fraser and Jesse L. Weston claim that the grail is merely a common archetype and that our idea of it evolved from earlier Celtic stories about a great magical pot that could provide endless food or raise the bodies of the dead that were flung into it. As John Hooper explains in The Inklings and King Arthur, the idea at the time was that the Arthurian, leg the Arthurian legends evolved from stories about an ancient vegetable deity 
whose mystery cults symbolize the death and rebirth of the seasons, right? The idea that there's this sort of primal religion that follows the seasons and that the god has to die and rise again in order to bring about the spring. Jesse Weston claimed that the grail literature and Christianity itself derived from this ancient cult, that Christianity is another of these fertility religions in which the god has to die and rise again in order to make the crops grow. Now, not everyone liked that theory. Charles Williams, for instance, as Suzanne Bray points out, strongly disagreed with these fashionable theories, which he felt missed the whole point of the Grail stories. Williams gracefully disposes of these theories of primitivism. At the beginning of his chapter in the figure of Arthur entitled The Grail, he writes about that cup, which absorbed, as I already mentioned, those cauldrons of plenty and vessels of magic, and he goes on, they have been supposed by learned experts to be the origin of the grail myth. That, in the scriptural and ecclesiastical sense, they certainly cannot be. The grail entered Europe with the Christian faith. It came from and with Christ. Now, I'm not here today to update academic theories on the origins of the grail, but instead to see what use the Inklings and other writers made of it and why, what origin they ascribed to it and why they thought that that mattered from theological points of view. So let's continue tracing its evolution from the tiny hints in the New Testament to the massive cultural archetype that it is today. But if you want, I can pause and take a couple questions here, because I know a lot of times you'll have a question that's like, I wish I could answer, ask it right away, rather than waiting to the end. So anything so far on like the biblical, the origins, or the Welsh um, and Celtic origins part? Or I can plow ahead. Yes? about which author invented it. Um, I'll get to the specifics of the French romances who first name it in a minute, but did you want me to go over the part about the, the fertility religion again? <laughs> um, well, so as to who invented it, probably this French author named Baudry de Bourgay in the 12th century, he's the first one who connects the cup that's this legendary cup that's in King Arthur's court to the one that Jesus drank from at the Last Supper. He's the first one to take those two ideas and put them together. Does that help? Thank you very much. That's all right. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have slides. Uh, right here. You want it? <laughs> you ate it. <laughs> Glastonbury. Second question. Yes. Um, alternate or integrated. They, they can occur together. That it's both the cup at the Last Supper. Joseph of Arimathea got a hold of it. And then he was there at the crucifixion. Caught Christ's blood in the cup. Buried Jesus' body. And then traveled to England with the cup and put it in Glastonbury Abbey. Yeah, so it's sort of an amalgamation of the legends. Excellent question. Very good. Yep. Absolutely, yes, and we will get to when it arrives at Glastonbury Abbey and how that uh, causes a great spike in tourism. Yes, excellent. Right, yeah, um, and sorry, I meant to be repeating the questions in case you can't hear them yet. Um, I thought of putting that on the quiz. What is the grail in Dan Brown's? And I was like, yeah. Um, uh, <clears throat> I know of two other places that have the body of a woman as the holy grail. And one is the book that Dan Brown mostly plagiarized. And the name is escaping me right now, the title of the book that Dan Brown, Holy Blood, Holy Grail. Thank you. Yeah, you're right. Um, and then the other is Charles Williams. Yeah, 
both as a cup and a cauldron, right? Yeah, excellent. Very well observed. Was there a hand here? Yes. Yep, there is a coincidence between the appearance of the Holy Grail and the Crusades. Yep. So why don't we go there now, because that's my next bit, is on that time period, the French romances. So thank you. Let's take a look at that. I, I paid him to say that. Um, so these are the texts that we know for sure contributed to the popularizing of the legend of the Grail, the French romances of the 12th and 13th centuries, the time of the Crusades, the time of the importance of relics, of wars over possession of holy sites and holy objects, right? These stories, which are long, sprawling narratives, are quintessential examples of, according to Richard Barber, how some sketchy biblical and apocryphal references became a medieval emblem of redemption. So again, we start with that little story seed, and we grow it into this monstrous narrative, which are the predecessors of what we think of as novels today, especially long, epic fantasy novels, right? These French romances are innovating the prose narrative. Now, not all of them are in prose, but some of them are innovating that as a form. Wait, I can tell a long story, not in meter? Um, and so eventually from there, we get the big fantasy novels that we have today. <clears throat> Joanna Bellis, again, writes that in the medieval imagination, drawing on biblical imagery led to the idea of cups as objects of heightened and polyvalent significance, representing conviviality and treasure and the sacred grail quest that is the apotheosis of the round table fellowship. Sharing the, king is the, sorry, sharing, sharing the cup is the symbol of the reciprocity between the king and the knight and between God and man. It is at the center of social and religious rituals of the community. However, think about this. It's an, always an ambivalent symbol. The highest honor that could come to the round table, the appearance of the grail, divides and destroys it. All of the best knights leave and go questing after the grail, and many of them never return. And so Arthur's kingdom is shorn of all of its best men, and the kingdom comes crashing down for a whole complex of other reasons as well. But there's that same sense, that idea of death and danger and wrath, as well as salvation and redemption in this cup. And so there again, authors have taken hints in the Bible about the cup of God's wrath and the cup of God's salvation and built on those to develop huge story complexes, teasing out possible implications. So now we come to this French writer whose name we've been tossing around a few times, Chrétien de Troyes. He was long thought to be the originator of the literary grail. His big innovation is in his poem called Percival, which is a story centered on the grail. He doesn't yet call it holy. At this point, it's just a mysterious vessel associated, associated with the wasteland, and the Fisher King, writes Holly Ordway. In Critian's narrative, the grail is beautiful and ethereal, but there's no suggestion of any connection with the Last Supper, or that it will become the dominant and defining quest of King Arthur's court. His grail is mysterious. What is it exactly? We see it pass by in a processional, but we never learn what it is. The unfinished poem does not answer that central question. But this cup is clearly something of great spiritual significance. And he wrote his poem about the same time that European Christians were applying a more literal reading to biblical texts. As Matilda Tomarin Bruckner writes, the romancer's unsettling inclusion of religious is issues within Arthurian narrative coincides with a new turn toward the Bible's literal and historical sense observable in both Christian and Jewish biblical exegesis. By investigating features shared by romance and by biblical interpretation, we can glimpse how a number of issues involving representation and interpretation disseminate through later grail stories. So if you think about that, if scholars are now looking at the Bible and thinking of them as more historical narratives and not, not only the four typologies that David talked to us about, right? These different um, archetypal and symbolic and allegorical readings, now they're saying, wait, this was historical. This was archaeologically verifiable, well then a physical object as proof and evidence becomes more important. So then it becomes crucial to trace down this cup to see who had it, who handed it down, um, and where it is now and so forth. Okay, so I mentioned that until recently scholarly consensus thought that the author I've just been talking about, Christian, invented the concept of the grail and introduced it in around 1180. However, 
I was excited to find recent research has traced an even earlier reference. The book is a chronicle by Baudry de Bourgay, which claims that a saint named Saint Budoc brought from Jerusalem a cup and platter which our Lord used during the Last Supper. Now this author died in 1130, so that means that the connection between the Last Supper and this, this legendary cup was made 50 years earlier than scholars thought. It might be interesting because maybe this is a source for Chrétien, and it has both the cup and the platter as being objects used at the Last Supper rather than one or the other. And there are various other narratives in which the cup and the platter are in a procession with the spear as well that pierced Christ's side and maybe other items known as hallows connected with the crucifixion. In Baudry de Bourgay's narrative, the, there's that connection between the gospel narratives and the grail and the Eucharist <clears throat> The round table fellowship is made a successor to the Last Supper fellowship. So these two groups of chosen men sitting around a table partaking from the same cup of our Lord with its Eucharistic significance. So then the cup, still at the center of the narrative, stands for a new imperative. Its association with the cup of the Last Supper forces a choice between social and spiritual obligations. So now you suddenly have these knights having to choose between staying home and fighting for their king versus going off to hunt for the Holy Grail. So before, loyalty to one's king and one God, were, one's God were united. And now suddenly these knights are faced with a choice. Um, now, the next important author is also this medieval French, another medieval French author from the time of the Crusades, Robert de Boron. And he makes the connection between these vessels and the Last Supper obvious and makes its Eucharistic significance unmistakable. He's the one that writes the story that at one point King Arthur travels to Jerusalem and then Joseph of Arimathea travels back to Glastonbury bringing the cup. So he's the one who explains how does the Holy Grail end up in England. And these French romances that I'm talking about are part of a larger movement. By the 12th century, the English church had realized the potential of the Grail myth to give the island a tangible connection to the gospel account, that physical object that shows, hey, we are an important center of worship. What's also interesting about all these works is they were written just when the church was wrestling with concepts about the Eucharist. The nature of the Lord's Supper and of the elements was not decided in the really early church councils from the first few centuries of church history. Rather, they were codified in the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215, which is pretty late if you think about it in the development of church history. And it was at that council that they adopted a canon that says, um, Jesus Christ, whose body and blood are truly contained in the sacrament of the altar under the forms of bread and wine, the bread being changed, and the word is transubstantio, sorry, transubstantiato, by divine power into the body and the wine into the blood. So that's the first time it was codified, was just when these romances were being written, saying, why does this cup have significance? Oh, it's the same cup that Jesus drank from when he instituted this important church sacrament, which we are just now codifying and is becoming one of the essential elements of our worship. And so, as I alluded to earlier, um, Glastonbury Abbey greatly increased its fame by its association with the Grail. Um, question about that before I go to Charles Williams' response about it? Okay. Uh, that was the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215. Charles Williams points out that this is the moment when the Eucharist became one of the settled doctrines of the church. And furthermore, he emphasizes its visible, material, and sensory nature. It's a, it's a local, material, tangible object. This insistence on the grail as a physical as well as a spiritual object, something that had literally contained the blood of Christ, transformed its significance from an analogy or a symbol to genealogy. So now it's an item passed down hand to hand through the centuries. The medieval Arthurian literature used it as the link through which to claim a direct ancestry from the Last Supper Fellowship. So those are the, those are the texts at the same time as the Crusades and as these important councils and the codification of Eucharist theology that really exploded the Grail literature and wrote, uh, and the most famous stories were written from which later ones drew, from which Mallory drew, um, which we could go into, and I think we'll kind of jump way ahead in history. Um, just that I think that Mallory 
took the earlier hints about the sacramental meaning of the grail tale and he sharpened them to a fine point and made their sacramental meaning unmistakable and unavoidable. And I think he tried to reunify that division I mentioned earlier, you know, that knights had to choose between staying home and being loyal to the king versus being loyal to God and going to hunt the grail quest. I think he tried to reunify those. Um, whether or not he succeeded is actually quite a, a scholarly debate. So I want to just also breeze over Tennyson here quickly for a minute. Um, but thoughts or questions or comments on that last little bit before we do the Victorian era in two and a half minutes. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, no, I just have a question. But so there we really have a Bob. So the Bob of Christianity yeah. takes the next to the Eucharist. Yeah. The Lent really takes the more and more. Absolutely. Like, Right. Because that was happening more over there as far as the church. Mm -hmm. but, but they could see it. Yes. And, and so that's, that's what I would connect with now with this because yeah. his, his vision for the Grail is very Christian. Yeah, absolutely. He Christian with that, and I think that this is much not. That's really good. Yeah, could everyone hear what Joe was saying? Uh, he's, talking about, he's talking I'm about. Sorry. He's talking about. He's talking about the visionary nature. Of, of the Grail in the middle in the High Middle Ages, um, and the, Ma, Val, Mallory has a very visionary approach. Yeah, the passage I was going to read is about when Lancelot looks through and sees the Grail, and he can't achieve it because of his sin with Guinevere. Um, but then the physicality of it is that he sees the priest hold up the host, and it turns into three men, yeah. Trinitarian, and the priest can't hold it up under the weight of these three men, and Lancelot jumps forward to help and gets struck down and blinded because he's not allowed to approach the Holy Grail. So yeah, it's visionary and it's physical. Yes? Yes. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Yes, in Tennyson. Well, then let's do Tennyson really briefly, shall we? Um, and I, I really don't like that I'm just doing a survey approach here and that we're just doing some of these really classic canonical authors. I would kind of like to do a, let's look at grail quests that have been written in the last 15 years by a much more diverse cast of authors. But I'm bringing us to the Inklings, so we need to look at the works that influenced them the most. Um, you're probably at least a little familiar with the idea of the Victorian crisis of faith when received notions about the universality and indisputability of scripture came under fire by skeptics, right? Um, in particular, this is when the academic field of higher criticism was developing, which basically subjected biblical texts to the same rigorous scrutiny as any other literary or historical works, right? They examined the provenance of the manuscripts, their composition history, the path of their transmission, the coherence of their authorship, and more. The results revealed that the authorship of the Bible was more complex than thought previously, and that many books of the Bible were written later than had been thought, and this shook a lot of people's faith. Tennyson's Idols of the King is, among many, many other things, an engagement with the conflicted notion of textual reliability. Whose stories can we trust? Can we believe written texts or oral narratives? So you could read that series of beautiful poems as a sequence of questions about unreliable narrators, unstable stories, misleading accounts, and the difficulties of knowing whose stories to believe. It's a text that poses all the questions we face when we try to base our lives on a text. Of course, as I said, it's also many other things like the return of a king. Tennyson was also writing during and indeed involved in the heyday of British spiritualism when respectable citizens gathered in darkened drawing rooms to hold seances. Voices from the other world, accounts of the afterlife and conversations with the dead, communication with the spiritual realm, these are all essential ideas underlying Tennyson's lush and lavish account of the Grail Quest. And fast on the heels of 19th century spiritualism came the 20th century occult revival, which is the area that I have studied. Guessing you'll have lots of questions about this section. So note them down and I'll, I'll make time to answer them. So the occult revival in England was a movement from roughly 1888 to 1945. And it followed several different occult secret societies 
that gained a great following, great number of members, most notably the Order of the Golden Dawn. And among these members of these various occult societies and theosophical society and so forth were many authors. Arthur Conan Doyle, Bram Stoker, William Butler Yeats, Andrew Lang, who collected all those colored fairy tale books, Edith Nesbitt, the Irish playwright John Todd Hunter. Um, you might not have heard of some of these other authors, Sax Romer, who wrote the uh, Fu Manchu mystery stories, George Russell, the poet A.E., Dion Fortune, Evelyn Underhill, um, William James, Rise of Religious Experience, was in the Society for Psychical Research, which was trying to find out if there was a scientific basis to these psychic phenomena, and the philosopher Henri Bergson. In their writing, occult authors often used powerful objects taken from quest lore in general and from the search for the Holy Grail in particular. They, adopted the, they adapted the image of the Grail to enhance their own poetic power. In various ways, each of these occult writers claims Eucharistic status for their invented rites, and thus each positions himself or herself as a poet, prophet, priest, whose writings hold out special secret knowledge to those who want to dive more deeply into the realities behind their systems of symbolism. So specifically, the Order of the Golden Dawn, because it was the most influential of these societies. It was founded by three Freemasons, and it incorporated the Masonic grade system of passing examinations and climbing up the levels and learning more, but it also was syncretistic. It brought in Kabbalism, which it reinterpreted, um, astrology, tarot, many different systems. It brought them all in and related them to each other. A significant difference between the Golden Dawn and Freemasonry is that it allowed women members and they could hold any rank, and indeed a woman eventually ran the uh, British branch. The rituals of the Order of the Golden Dawn do not mention the Grail. However, the tarot cards were very important in their practices of divination, and they believed in the principle of correspondence. Have you heard of this? As above, so below, that everything here on Earth is a microcosm or a miniature of something in the noumenal realm. So they, according to the rule of correspondence, the tarot suit of the chalice is an emblem of the Holy Grail. So they did have this chalice imagery that they used in divination. So therefore, high-level officiants who practiced tarot divination were, in one sense, priests and priestesses of the grail. Golden Dawn rituals often include pseudo-Eucharistic services, such as in the neophyte initiation service, which is the lowest level, when they set up an altar with a red cross and a white tri triangle on it, a red rose, a red lamp, a cup of wine, and a paten, a platter, of bread and salt. And at the climax of that rite, the officiant, the hierophant, says, I invite you to inhale with me the perfume of this rose as a symbol of the air. And he smells the rose. To feel with me the warmth of this sacred fire, and spreads his hands over the fire. To eat with me this bread and salt as types of earth, dips the bread in the salt and eats. And finally, to drink with me this wine, the consecrated emblem of elemental water, makes a cross in the air with the cup and drinks from it. In each subsequent ceremony at higher and higher levels, the syncretistic Eucharistic imagery becomes more complex, draws more and more from the Jewish Kabbalistic system of mysticism. The idea is that the initiate gradually becomes an adept, rising up the grades of the order until he or she becomes a priest or priestess of the rosy cross, bearer of the mysteries, able to partake in the ultimate primal rite in the noumenal realm, unified with his or her divine self. That's the goal of all modern occultism, is to unite with the divine self within. You are God, you just forgot that you were God, go through our order and we will help you relearn that you are God and communicate with your divine self. We can see here that the story that grew up in the Golden Dawn has gone very far indeed from the original biblical story seed of a cup served to Jesus by his disciples. It has developed from an exoteric public narrative available for all to read and to participate in if they will, to a super secret, intricate system of interlocking networks of symbols and embodied ritual. But though their rituals are far from orthodox, indeed, I believe blasphemous, they do share some of the essence. The dish and the cup, the bread and the wine are still spiritually meaningful when eaten as part of a ritual in fellowship with others, an activity of body, soul, and community, 
which I think just points to our universal longing for those things. That if we're not getting them in our church communities, then we're going to turn elsewhere for them. And there are some really complex socio-historical reasons that the modern occult revival grew up at this time and claimed so many members. Um, so as my time is running down, which would you rather hear about? More of the writers in The Golden Dawn, or do you want me to jump ahead to the Inklings? Okay. Dumb question. <clears throat> Um, we need to mention one other character who is the transition from the Order of the Golden Dawn to the Inklings, and that's Arthur Edward Waite. He was a member of the Golden Dawn, and there was a leadership crisis, and then he created an ostensibly Christian spin-off occult secret order, Christian occult order, okay? Um, he's, it was the Fellowship of the Rosy Cross. He started it in 1915. He stripped out some of the imagery, like especially Egyptian symbolism, and upped the putatively Christian content in the rituals, and he added a significant emphasis on the grail. He wrote a book called The Hidden Church of the Holy Grail, and he has in it a theory that at the Last Supper, Jesus not only said all the things that are written down in the Gospels, but also performed a super secret mass that never got written down, but the disciples memorized it, and it's been passed down by word of mouth to Joseph of Arimathea, bearer of the grail, and then generation by generation, it's been passed down to the members of the Holy Assembly, the, the priests of the secret order. And guess who has it now? But Arthur Edward Waite, right, um, has the secret rituals. So when he wrote his rituals for the Fellowship of the Rosy Cross, he was trying to um, access, copy down um, this originary, the dominical Eucharistic rite. So the secret one of which every mass performed in a church is only a faint shadow, he says. So that's, that's his idea of what the uh, grail symbolizes. So it's a synecdoche then for the hidden Eucharist of which he is the prophet. He writes, I least of all am the authorized spokesman of stewards behind the veil. Okay, so Charles Williams exists in both of the circles I've been talking about, the occult and the Christian traditions of the grail. He was a member of the Fellowship of the Rosy Cross that's A.E. Waite's ostensibly Christian one, for 10 years from 1917 to 1927. When Greville Lindop's biography of Williams was published a few years ago, we learned that Williams was also an attendee of another order, name unknown. For 20 years, every other Sunday night, he went to his local priest's vicarage to learn about <laughs> occult matters. And that man, or there were two men, they're leading it, Nicholson and Lee, they had been leaders in the Golden Dawn and still had the documents, the teaching documents called Flying Rolls. Um, so Williams was trained in Golden Dawn rituals to some extent, which explains why there's a lot of stuff in his works that he never would have learned in A.E. Waite's supposedly Christian fellowship. So then how did Charles Williams use the grail? In a very complex way, of course. Um, his Eucharistic theology, Suzanne Bray reminds us, has to be situated in the context of the Anglo-Catholic stream of the Church of England in the first half of the 20th century, and also in the context of that occult revival I've just outlined, because these things are running concurrently and have a surprising number of overlaps. In William's poetry, the grail itself is a symbol or even a sacrament, just like the elements of the Lord's Supper, so not just what it contains, but the vessel itself. Both are visible, physical signs of Christ's presence. In his Arthurian poetry, Taliesin through Logras and the Region of the Summer Stars, he makes the grail the sacred object that serves to reveal the spiritual condition of each character and is the apex of his narrative arc. He does this in his poetry by using the grail as a catalyst of spiritual disclosure. His character's responses to it reveal their, their condition, whether they are heading for heaven or for damnation. It functions a lot like the way the crime does in a murder mystery. So if you think your favorite murder mystery, maybe you have this quiet, sleepy little English village and everybody just seems like such good, upright citizens. The crime occurs, and as you get to know each character, you learn all of their evil secrets and you suspect them one by one by one. So the grail kind of works like that in William's literature, that whenever anybody interacts with it, you see their true spiritual condition by how they respond to it. He wrote, the grail is to some a test, to some fruition, to some union, to some torment. In his poetry, knights and ladies can approach the grail when their souls are in right relationship with God, 
while those who have turned away from righteousness are unable to achieve it. Perhaps Williams's greatest Arthurian innovation is the degree to which he united the episodic tales of King Arthur and his knights doing all these different quests and all these different adventures and his courtly life and Lancelot and Guinevere intrigue united those with the spiritual quest for the Holy Grail in a relationship closer than maybe had been done in literature before. He wrote, the Grail must take the central place. Logres then must be meant for the Grail. On the first day of his rule, Williams has King Arthur stand up and look over Camelot and ask himself, is the king made for the kingdom or the kingdom made for the king? Will I serve my kingdom or will I use it to get what I want? And he answers the question wrongly. And this act of putting himself up against his God-given duty is the first of many such decisions that cause the destruction of the empire. So it could be argued then that Charles Williams brought the stories of the Grail back more closely in line with a biblical narrative of creation, fall, and redemption, of sacrament and ecclesiology, and of final glory. Or it could be argued that instead he presented the world with an occult grail, grail under a veneer of Christian terminology. Or both. And I think I'm just going to leave it there on the mysterious ending because that is such a long discussion of which way Charles Williams' grail goes um, I think it's both, and I don't think they can really be disentangled. I do think in his later works, he repudiated some elements of the occultism that he'd been trained in, and he brought back some um, stronger ideas of God's transcendence and so forth, but I'm not sure he ever got rid of that idea of getting in touch with the divine self within, and I feel like there's a little bit of his ambiguity when he talks about Christ, whether he's talking about the historical figure with his death and resurrection and salvation, or if he's talking about a Christ spirit, as some of his um, occult teachers did. So I may be leaving you unsatisfied, but perhaps in the round table we can talk a bit more about Lewis and Tolkien's grails, and of course I would love to continue these conversations later. So thank you very much. Thank you.